from popular state parks whose shadowed shores are surrounded in chilling ghost stories of the past, to revolutionary war-era battlefields where spectral soldiers and much darker forces are rumored to wander on foggy, moonless nights. Are you sure you're ready to brave our second list of picks for some of the most haunted places in Delaware? Number 5. Jessup's Tavern Jessup's Tavern, which is located off of Delaware Street out of Newcastle, Delaware, is a historic and popular pub site recognized both as one of the state's only themed restaurants and also as one of its oldest standing structures. Historically, in 1674, the building now housing Jessup's would be constructed just 23 years after Newcastle was settled as a private residence, and later, in 1724, this property would be purchased under coppersmith and barrel maker Abraham Jessup, who would reside on site while also selling drink and other provisions to travelers arriving off the ships. Following Jessup's ownership, the premises would be passed through a slew of owners, all the while acting as a private residence and for various other purposes until the 1950s, when it was converted and fully transformed into the dining establishment known as the Captain's Log Restaurant. In 1974, the Captain's would be sold and, under new owners, would be re-established as the Green Frog Tavern. And more recently, through November of 1996, this establishment would be acquired under the Day family, who would re-establish the site once more as Jessup's Tavern in honor of Old Abe. Into the present, Jessup's remains under the ownership of the Day family, who have persistently issued their own repairs, upgrades, modernizations, and more, all while truly respecting and cherishing the historical gem they've been so blessed with. Jessup's has continued to win numerous awards for its service, drinks, and dishes, and offers an authentic colonial cuisine both in their meals and drinks preparations and presentations. Rather classically, Jessup's is rumored to harbor a range of spirits tied to its past owners, employees, patrons, residents, and more. And over its years, both staff and visitors to its pounds have reported orbs that are both visible to the naked eye and also captured in photography and video. Objects that are sighted moving around on their own or even floating in midair. Kitchen utensils and appliances discovered moved to odd locations and under impossible time frames. And encounters with a black, ominous, shadowy mass. Several informal investigations of the expanse have yielded odd EMF fluctuations, crystal clear EVPs, anomalies caught on thermal grids, and silhouettes captured in recordings, while others have described extreme cold spots felt in adverse weather, doors that open and close spontaneously, instances of lights flicking off suddenly and leaving all present in total darkness, disembodied voices, encounters with a host of full-bodied apparitions, and the unnerving feelings of being watched, of being followed, or even of being touched by someone or something unseen. Number 4. Lums Pond State Park Lums Pond State Park, which is located off of Howell School Road out of Bear in Newcastle County, Delaware, is a popular 1,790-acre rec area that's aquatic expanse, which sits at 200 acres, holds the title of actually being the largest freshwater pond in the state. Historically, in 1724, lands now hosting Lums Pond were initially settled by Samuel Clement, who would construct what is now recognized as the Lums Mill House. Following Clement's death in 1783, his land would be transferred to one Isaac Allman, and following Allman's passing in 1802, they would be transferred once again to his son-in-law, John Lum. Subsequently, in 1809, the weathered house, which was initially a one-story structure toting three bays, would welcome the addition of a second story. Notably, predating the existence of Lums Pond, the region's hardwood forest would be graced by the St. George's Creek, and the area would act as a significant native hunting ground. However, in 1823, and resulting from the construction of the C&D Canal, this flow would be dammed, resulting in the forming of the pond we know today. Over the years, Lums Pond would supply water necessary to fill the canals, locks, and power local grist mills. Steadily, the Lum family would sell off more of their lands to the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal Company, and through the mid-20th century, ownership of the expanse would be transferred to the state, after which, in 1963, it was officially established as a state park, which in turn, in 1966, would acquire the Lums Mill House as well. In the present, Lums Pond State Park acts as a center for recreation to both locals and tourists, and offers a range of options in boating, angling, hiking, cross-country skiing, camping, horseback riding, and more. 
Over its many years of usage, the Lums Pond area has seemingly always been shrouded in tales of encounters with the supernatural and good old-fashioned campfire stories, and those braving its bounds have reported a range of inexplicable encounters, including but not limited to extreme cold patches felt in adverse weather, encounters with cryptids or strange abominations, and both orbs and UFOs sighted in the skies and skirting just above the waterline. A range of both shadowy manifestations and full-bodied apparitions have been encountered across park grounds, including the likes of a spectral John Lum himself, who's often sighted accompanied by his son near his old mill, right where many also report the sounds of water wheels with no source. Another popular Lum's Pond story tells of how the Underground Railroad ran right past it, and of how some claim the restless spirits of those who didn't quite make it to freedom still linger through the area. Incidentally, several have spied spectral manifestations darting silently through the darkness, while others have described hearing the sounds of what seems to be an intense chase or search for someone with no source. A final, exceedingly disturbing Lums legend tells of how way back through the 1870s, a young girl ran away from her home in Newcastle County, some say due to abuse or unhappy circumstances, and ended up hiding out on lands now holding the state park. Sadly, it's told that right near Swamp Trail, this girl happened upon a strange man camping out, who savagely assaulted her before leaving her dead body to be later discovered along where the popular path now lies. To date, a surprising number of unrelated reports are documented each year, in which established community figures, prominent names, and the like, all who are hiking Swamp Trail, hear the panic-inducing screams and pleas of a woman obviously under attack. Tragically, however, try as they might, no one is ever able to locate the source of this commotion. Number 3. The Cape May Lewis Ferry the Cape May Lewis Ferry, which is located off of Cape Henlopen Drive out of Lewis, Delaware, is a popular ferry terminal that's craft traverses the 17-mile stretch across the Delaware Bay to North Cape May in New Jersey, and its path actually comprises a portion of U.S. Route 9 is literally the final crossing of the Delaware River and Bay before touching the Atlantic. Historically, in 1926, interested parties would begin discussing the prospect and utility of a ferry running from Cape May to Lewis. However, after only a few short months, this early project was scrapped and wouldn't again be proposed until the 1960s. After which, following months of prep and on October 17th of 1962, the Delaware River and Bay Authority would conduct its first trial ferry runs. On July 1st of 1964, official and regular ferry services were launched and would utilize a fleet of five steamers purchased out of Virginia, with their very first trip departing from Cape May and ending in Lewis. Through the 1970s, all of these line steamers would be replaced with its current fleet, and sadly, in 1975, operations were drastically reduced from 24-hour shifts to only 16, though notably, ferry profits would actually start to increase. In 1988, the ferry's terminal building were constructed, and more recently, in the year 2000, they would be expanded and renovated with the Cape May Terminal reconstructed entirely. The Cape May Lewis Ferry remains open and in operation into the present, offering gift shops, food courts, bars, restaurants, a range of both history and art exhibits, and of course, tickets and its ferry service, a trip which, notably, takes around 85 minutes one way. Like something out of a Lovecraftian short, the Lewis Terminal, which is the object of our attention tonight, was constructed atop the site of an old, unknown sailor's cemetery, which is literally now paved over by its parking lot. Incidentally, it's widely accepted that hundreds, if not thousands, of colonial-era sailors both lost at sea and whose bodies were discovered on Lewis's shoreline, after having been thrown overboard various vessels, are interred mere meters below the asphalt world of the living. As if things couldn't get any freaking creepier, during the aforementioned 1960s construction, ancient pottery shards were discovered about, leading many to believe that predating settlement, the area was likely utilized by those native to the region as well. Now, as any good scary movie fan can tell you, decimated ancient civilizations and disturbed and honestly, in this case, even disrespected gravesites are pretty much the crocker recipe for creating really messed up haunted locations. And not surprisingly, those frequenting the terminal and surrounding lands have reported a range of inexplicable phenomena, including objects sighted moving on their own, phantom wafts of cigar smoke without source, instances of doors opening and closing by themselves, and encounters with pale, spectral figures that drift about after hours, long after the site has been closed and locked up for the night. 
EVPs of what are believed to be the voice of a former nurse who worked the Lewis Quarantine Station, which was actually one of the first immigrant screening centers in the country, have been captured in various locations, while the ghost of a man with long white hair and clad in a cape has been spied both stalking the gift shop and also adjacent streets and alleyways at night. Lastly, a handful of fables detail encounters with a ghost dubbed Sunny, who one woman claimed appeared to be a police officer whom she was able to actually describe down to a T. Subsequently, in 2014, paranormal investigations of the premises would also yield EVPs and other clues that led them to a former ferry boat captain, one Mr. Sunny Millman. And while it's uncertain if these two Sunnies are connected or not, or if our first witness maybe mistook the captain's uniform as an officer's instead, sightings of a manifest manifestation or two separate manifestations described as both a captain and at times as an officer continue to this day. Number 2. The Cooch's Bridge Battlefield the Cooch's Bridge Battlefield, which is located off of South Old Baltimore Pike out of Newark, Delaware, is a popular expanse and historic district preserving the site of the 1777 Battle of Cooch's Bridge, which notably was actually the only battle of the American Revolution to be fought on Delaware soil, and by some accounts might possibly have been the first time the Stars and Stripes were actually flown in battle. Historically, in 1746, one Thomas Cooch would settle into the locale, and by 1760, would construct a home for he and his family. On September 3rd of 1777, amidst the American Revolution, the Battle of Cooch's Bridge would be fought between the Continental Army and American militia, and a German force serving alongside the British Army. When all was said and done, the British would claim victory on this one, with around 73 casualties shared between both sides, and incidentally, the Cooch's property would be held under the victors for a time before several of its buildings were burned to the ground, and for weeks following, Cornwallis himself would utilize the abode as a headquarters through his regroup. Notably, the original Cooch's Bridge was in pretty rugged shape following its 1777 appearance, and sadly, would not survive the war. However, in 1922, our current Cooch's Bridge was constructed in its stead. In 2003, the Cooch family would sell a portion of their lands alongside development rights to 200 acres of battlefield to the state, after which they would remain in their home on site until 2018, when it too was deeded to the state. In the present, the Cooch's Bridge Battlefield remains open to the public, offering a range of educational materials and displays, some of which that pertain to the revolution, to the history of enslavement, to the preservation of the natural landscape, to early industrialization, to the social history of state farm life, and more. Chillingly, the whole of this weathered expanse is rumored to harbor the souls of the many lost across its bounds, and those braving the battlefield have reported disembodied voices and phantom gunshots, the smells of both spent powder and of burning flesh, the feelings of being surrounded or of being watched by someone or something unseen, extreme cold spots, and orbs in strange forms captured in photography and video. Rather ominously, just preceding the battle itself, several American sentries reported observing a white spectral horseman that they actually claimed to have fired on, but to their astonishment, that remained completely unharmed. While several speculate this ghostly manifestation may have been nothing more than an actual living, breathing British soldier who was feeling particularly brave and decided to don body armor and a white sheet in order to strike fear into his opponents, others aren't so certain, as encounters with the glowing rider who always hurdles off into the the horizon at unnatural speeds continue to this day. Following the battle, some sources claim resulting dead were buried hastily through the area. However, no one is certain exactly where, and this lack of posthumous honors is said to have left more than a few souls at unrest. Incidentally, a range of apparitions related to the battle have been sighted roaming about, seemingly searching for their bodies or for their rightful final resting places. A final and infinitely popular Cooch's Bridge legend tells that on foggy, moonless nights, the road near the battle site is roamed by the specter of a headless soldier, whose cranium was stricken from its shoulders by way of cannon fire in life, and whose decapitated ghost is seemingly stuck searching night after night for its missing skull. While some claim this ghost might be related to American Charlie Miller, whose head was removed courtesy of a British cannon, others aren't so certain, as a good bulk of encounters detail the form toting a British uniform. And seeing as America never used cannons in this battle, this would likely mean whoever it was met their fate at the hands of friendly fire, which, if you ask us, is a pretty darn good reason for a soul to be restless. Number 1. Woodburn 
Woodburn, or the Delaware Governor's Mansion, or Governor's House, which is located off of Kings Highway Southwest out of Dover, Delaware, is a prominent historic abode and the official residence to the governor of the state that's widely recognized as one of the finest middle period Georgian houses in the region still in existence. Historically, in 1684, lands now holding Woodburn would be acquired through Grant under the Swedish crown by David Morgan and family. In 1784, Charles Hilliard III would make purchase of the land, and from 1790 to 1798, he would set to work on the construction of Woodburn. In 1814, Woodburn would be inherited by Hilliard's daughter, Mary, and her husband, Dr. Merchant, lawyer, and U.S. Senator Martin W. Bates. Subsequently, in 1820, Bates would lease Woodburn to Governor Jacob Stout, which would mark the first time the expanse had been utilized as an executive's residence. And in 1825, Bates would sell the property to Daniel and Mary Cowgill, after which the Cowgills, who were devoted Quakers and abolitionists, would free those the family had previously kept enslaved, and would allow for them to meet in the great hall they'd been kept from for so long. For years, Woodburn would remain in Cowgill family hands, until 1912 when it was sold to Daniel O. Hastings, who would in turn, in 1918, sell the expanse to a Frank Hall. Following Frank's passing in 1953, the property would be acquired under Thomas Murray, who would, in 1965, sell the site to then-Governor Charles L. Terry Jr. and wife Jessica, after which the mansion has served as the official governor's abode ever since. In the present, Governor John Carney and wife Tracy currently reside at Woodburn, and from Monday through Friday, the site offers public tours by appointment, which notably must be scheduled at least 24 hours in advance. Chillingly, ghost stories associated with the mansion stretch back to shortly after its construction, when, in 1815, just 25 years after its completion, the Bates were entertaining a guest who, at breakfast, when asked by Mary to lend a prayer, suggested to her that they should wait for their other guest. Bewildered, Mary asked what other guest he might be referring to, to which their current guest described to her an older gentleman he'd met on the stair, who wore a powdered wig, knee breeches, and a ruffled shirt. In shock, Mary realized the figure this guest was describing was none other than her father and the builder of Woodburn himself, Mr. Charles Hilliard III. From this date forward, multiple encounters with the spirit of Charles have been documented, including by Mr. Frank Hall, the later owner, who claimed to often pass by Hilliard on the stairs, and who described him much the same as past owners and patrons had. Notably, long-standing local legend claims that if one leaves wine or stronger drink downstairs overnight, that the ghost of Charles, who was an avid drinker in life, is likely to leave the glass, cup, or whatever completely empty by morning. Also reported across Woodburn are disembodied footsteps that emanate from empty spaces, a spectral little girl in a red gingham dress and bonnet who carries with her a candle, whom wanders the grounds near the reflecting pool, and that actually made a highly public appearance in the Great Hall at the 1985 inaugural party of Governor Mike Castle, and a spectral silhouette clad in Revolutionary War garb who's been observed gliding about the corridors after dark. Lastly, during the Quaker Cowgill family's ownership, Woodburn would act as a stop on the Underground Railroad, and one night, when a group of slave raiders attempted to search the mansion, Dan actually fought, scared, and chased them off of his land. Ironically, one of the vermin ended up treeing himself in the front yard, and while he managed to go unnoticed by Dan and his men, his plan would ultimately backfire completely when he made a fatal slip, got caught up on a tree knot, and literally hanged himself with no one else around to assist, which comically, they likely would have. To date, many tell you can still hear the evil man's doomed cries and pleas, gurgles, and throes, as he forever relives his appropriately torturous death, which some claim is his own personal hell for the horrors he inflicted on other human beings. Additionally, this raider's spirit has also been known to manifest on the ground as a threatening, mottled, and ghoulish entity that mindlessly shambles after any who cross its path. Taking its fascinatingly significant and simultaneously frequently dark history into account, and coupling it with such an impressive assortment of associated local legends and purported encounters with the otherworldly, we felt Woodburn was the perfect choice as this list's most haunted place in Delaware. Thanks for joining us for our second list of picks for some of the most haunted places in Delaware. If you enjoyed hearing our histories and ghost stories, subscribe to our channel, like this upload, and share us with anyone you feel could use a good scare. We'll catch you all next time.